It's ad break time. I'm pleased to announce that the Beyond Solitaire podcast remains proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. And as usual, they are up to amazing things. First, their latest game, 500-Year-Old Vampire, is on Backer Kit through August 16th. And that means you have two more days to get over there and check it out. Second, it's time for another year of courses for CLGS's Certificate in Applied Game Design. Damon Stone's class, Core Loop, Finding, Amplifying, and Refining the Fun, starts on August 28th, so you should absolutely go and register for it. As usual, I also want to plug my own Patreon, which can be found at patreon.com slash beyondsolitaire. If you enjoy my work, your support would mean a lot to me. That money is what lets me be on site for con coverage, pick up copies of unusual games to play for the channel, and upgrade the equipment that I use to film and edit videos, so anything would help. But for now, thank you so much. Let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I have a very special guest on the podcast this week. This is Dr. Jeremiah McCall. He is a history teacher and a historical game studies scholar. So, uh, Jeremiah, tell us about uh, tell us about your teaching life. You, like me, are a post-ac high school teacher, and we both spend our lives getting run around by those kids. So tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, the, so the, quick ver the quick version is, yeah, I finished my PhD in Roman history in, uh, I guess, 23 years ago. Um, and for many reasons, um, decided to go into high school teaching um, and really from the very beginning was interested in games um, and, and, and history education. So uh, I had some courses very early on um, where kids were making historical simulations. There wasn't a lot of talk about that. I mean, simulation games like physical ones had been talked a lot about in the 60s and 70s in some writings, but hadn't been really talked about since. So I was kind of just making stuff up. Um, and from there, because I ended up at this, this, this wonderful school I'm still at, Cincinnati Country Day School, um, where they had laptops, a one-on-one -on -one laptop program, I started exploring video games um, and did a lot of work with that. But then maybe uh, a lot of work with that in the classroom, I mean. But um, maybe eight years ago, something like that, um, I really started getting back into board games some more, um, just because, it, as, as I know you know, there's things you can get out of board games in the classroom that you can't get out of video games. You, you, the same is true the other way, but there's just some really nice, particularly like social things that are going on with board games. Um, so I started designing some games for classes um, and started incorporating uh, more sort of teaching basic uh, board game design and things like that. Um, and... Uh, yeah. And so I've been doing games in the classroom for 20 plus years. And um, if by writing you mean I have a contract, I am writing a book on how to have teachers design board games for history classes and have students design board games for history classes. If by writing you mean actually physically writing, uh, I'm procrastinating and doing everything else, um, but I'll get to it. Hey, this podcast is important public scholarship. <laughs> 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 Absolutely right. This is right. This is, I, I what what do they call that? It's outward facing. I'm outward facing. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So next year is actually be my tenth year in the high school classroom, and I honestly cannot believe it because it really feels like I fell asleep yesterday and I woke up in year ten. Um, yeah. But I, I feel like gaming pedagogy has just been getting hotter and hotter over that time. Um, what was the state of classroom gaming when you first got interested in it? And then how have you seen it change? Because I feel like you've probably seen a broader sweep than I have. Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and any answer I have to this question, right. Shout out to all those teachers who 20 and 30 years ago were using games and, and, I didn't meet you and, and you're wonderful. And, 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 and you know, and I'm, and I'm sorry that we didn't uh, uh, um, know each other. Um, so for me, it felt very much. Um, so I first used uh, board games and computer games in the classroom about uh, 21, 22 years ago, maybe 23 years ago. Um, I've been at this, uh, at, at this teaching position for 21 years. Um, and at that point, point there 
there wasn't a lot. There were individuals doing things with board games in the classrooms like they had been for years, but there weren't really any texts on it in the uh, late 90s or early 2000s. Um, there wasn't uh, any kind of conferences on it. Um, I think, you know, part of that, right, is it, it, I, I'm not I'm not a board game historian in, in any sense. But if we're going to date like, you know, modern board gaming to like Catan, right, that's only middle of the of, of the 90s. So the idea that there'd be all these varieties of games out there that people could use for uh, classrooms, I just don't think was was really thought of very much. Um, so for me. I started, I, I, uh, I taught a class in 2004 called Designing Historical Simulations. And it was about making physical board games. And because um, what I had learned as a teacher designing is that there is no better way to learn your history about something than to make a game about it. Because you've got to know it. You've got to research it, and know the details and figure out how the systems are working and everything like that. Um, so... Uh, there was that part of the class, but then I was like, hmm, Civilization Three. that seems to say some things about the ancient world that aren't the craziest things one might say about the ancient world. So how about we play a little bit of that too? Um, and there was, uh, and there's been a revival of this. There was a group at the time at the University of Wisconsin-Madison called Games Learning and Society that was mostly video games, but doing a, some board game work too. Um, and they started... Uh, uh, having me come in, and speak and talk about my classroom experiences. And so I thought, hey, cool. And shout out Kurt Squire, as always, as I do, for inviting me to do those things. Um, I thought, cool, this is something that I'm interested in. The kids seem to really enjoy, and people seem to want to hear what I have to say about the, uh, about the, uh, 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 about the topic. So Take that about 2004, 2005. What happened in the middle was historical game studies. Um, it turned out that when I wrote, I wrote a book called Gaming the Past in 2011 um, on using video games in the classroom. Could totally use it for board games. That just wasn't where my, my focus was at the time. That ended up being part of a series of very few, but a few monographs that were written between about 2010 and about 2016 on games as history and how they show history and what you you know what to think about when you're critiquing them as history and everything like that. And I think it's really that sort of early two strands, historical game studies sort of at the 2010 on and games and learning at the maybe 2005 on that started to grow from there. And now, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's picking up a, a lot of steam. Um, I am an adjunct, at, a research adjunct at Carleton University in Ottawa, which is mostly because I have some colleagues there and I just really enjoy being able to work with them on some things. But I've I've been a reader for two master's theses in the last year or two where the students decided, decided to design a historical board game as their thesis um, rather than rather than um, just writing a standard dissertation on a topic. So, oh, yeah, cool. I think it's coming. Which is why I'm writing that book is the hope is that, you know, even though this has been going on for so many of us for decades, I'm kind of like, OK, seems like it's actually the right time to say, hey, have you thought about board games? Yeah. On the one hand, they've been here a lot longer. But on the other hand, we haven't been focusing on them as much as we should in, in history education. So. so I actually have it's sort of a parallel set of questions that has emerged from this. So I want to talk about video games first and then board games, but it's basically the same set of questions. So when you're using okay. video games to teach in the classroom. How do you do that? Like, how do you make sure that the kids are getting playtime, that they're getting the right playtime? How do you select the games? How do you get the licensing for them to play those games? Like, how does that work? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, um, and 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 don't even for a moment. I know you. I know you don't, Liz. But don't even for a moment, listeners, think that I get much money off this. If you happen to go and buy the second edition of Gaming the Past, but there is a book out there I wrote on that. Uh, if you want to just like buy me a Starbucks, I think the royalties ends up being about the same. Um, <laughs> but shout out there because that's certainly the place to go for more detail. But um, for here and now, so um, purposeful play is the goal, and that's kind of what I've kind of uh, what I've found. And um, any you, Liz, or anybody else who wants to talk about this, just hit me up. It's easy to find me, and I'm always happy to talk shop about your specific case. Um, but generally speaking, 
you got to find games and you got to make and you got to make um, uh, uh, lessons. You, you have to prepare for students to learn the games. If it's something that's in, uh, that's very simple, like, for example, have you heard of uh, Charles Games Be Carbonize? No. Um, it's a uh, climate change game from Charles Games, which is a game design company in Prague with the university. I forget whether it's the University of Charles or Charles University, but they made this free game uh, that runs on Android and Apple, but also on computers uh, about uh, catastrophic climate change and the things that might be done and might not be done um, um, to help with that. That's a game I can throw in front of kids. They can play it for 45 minutes and there's going to be some good learning in there. I can talk about, okay, the structures and the systems and stuff like that. Something like a civilization or I'm, I'm jumping off the deep end this year and using Europa Universalis for my 10th graders. Um, I have never tried that before. I don't know of anybody who's tried that with 10th graders before. That's going to take hours and hours of playtime to be able to learn what you need to to get to that purposeful play. But that's part of it. So you kind of tailor. Um, remember, like the glory days? What was it? When did Flash die? Flash died what permanently? Like five years ago, four years ago? Yes. There were so Recent-ish. many historical games. Yeah, I think twenty twenty maybe when the browsers. Maybe. Yeah, I think it was at my current school because we started getting notices about it. Oh, it's so sad. <sighs> um, and there are ways to kind of get some of the stuff that was on there, but that was always my first go-to stop um, for people say, "Go play a flash game." Kids can learn it really quickly. Uh, it's probably it's probably free. Uh, it probably can run on whatever computer you have um, and go from there. Um, I'm fortunate enough at Country Day. Um, I'm really it's a fantastic school, and I'm very and I'm very privileged to be able to to teach here. Our kids have Surface computers, so we can actually run Steam games. Um, wow, uh, modest Steam games. Um, but running Civ 4 is possible, although Civ 4 doesn't seem to be playing well with Windows 11, it turns out. But um, so I, I'm fortunate enough that I can actually have my kids purchase a game or two as if as a book, uh, you know, as a, a bookstore purchase, if you will. Um, if, if you don't have that, then you start to think about, well, do you have a computer lab? And can you purchase a set of uh, uh, copies for the, compu- uh, for the computer lab? If you want to go completely free, you can go with uh, 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 is it fciv.net, I believe is the one, is the 3D version of uh, Civilization that's public domain. Uh, Becarbonize, as I mentioned, is a really good free game. Um, there's lots of good ways to do that, too. Uh, so I don't. I probably didn't answer like half of your question, but that's like the starting sort of things to think about. But no, you've got to learn how to play, and then I think you need an analytical framework to make that play purposeful, absolutely. Just playing a game by itself, fantastic as a human being, go play a game by yourself. Uh, As an educational thing, that debriefing, that interaction, that analysis is the part that's really critical. Yeah, I think this actually establishes a couple things that I wanted to, which is one, you know, when we talk about video games in the classroom, that doesn't mean that every kid is playing Assassin's Creed and like using that to learn the geography of whatever city that volume is in. Video games can encompass like a really wide range of things, things that are free, things that are educationally based. You know, it's not like you're having to bring a AAA game and a PlayStation 5 into your classroom. Although that's cool, but like... (laughs) <laughs> I did. I, I actually have used. Um, do, you, do you know about the discovery tours with Assassin's Creed? So, so, so I did play around with uh, the Assassin's Creed Odyssey discovery tour. I have a gaming laptop. Um, again, I'm so fortunate to be at the school I am because they covered the gaming laptop, so I could do some of this exploration. But we've def- actually done that where we've played the discovery tour par- portion. See, I say where we've played, but really right. what I mean is where I've played on my gamepad, and then the kids got to go, wow, I wish I could play this. And it's like, yeah, but you're not old enough, but at least this part's rated for kids. So it's Take okay. it up with your parents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is, not, yeah, that is not for me to decide. Indeed. I mean, I will say my parents let us have Grand Theft Auto when we were young, but that was their choice. <laughs> I this is this is where our age gap is going to be a little different. There was no Grand Theft Auto when I was a kid. So my parent, you know, when 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 I was a teenager it was like Ultima 4 and 3 and stuff like that. I mean, it was still very 2D characters on game, so. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, but the other thing that you talked about that I want to hit on kind of as we go back into board games is the idea of overhead. So one thing that I appreciate when I'm playing a video game versus a board game is that a video game, you can pretty much boot it up and start playing. 
Mm -hmm. I, I will say that is not true of what I've been trying to learn recently, which is Europa Universalis 4, which PhD or not uh, terrifies me, but we're working on it. Um, but, you know, for the most part, you know, a modern game will have a tutorial. You know, kids play a lot of video games, so they might intuitively kind of pick it up. I think board games are a little bit different and you have to budget that time mm -hmm. to teach the game um, versus let the game do the teaching. So, yep. I, how do you, what weight of board game, what types of board games are you bringing into your, into your classroom and how does that selection process work for you? Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, 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 the ability of a video game to boot up and work and run really complicated calculations in the background and things like that, uh, is amazing. Um, and, um, and, and has lots of places in the classroom. The ability of a board game um, has amazing kind of uh, tactile qualities to it. It has amazing social engagement qualities to it. But there's the, uh, there's the overhead. You got to learn to play, which you do with digital games, like you said. Um, you've got to set up the game. And if it's not playable within a class period, you got to break down the game and find some way to sort of save the game state. I think that was part of the reason that I wasn't actually, you know, it, I, now that I think about it, it absolutely is. Our school made a, a, a conscientious decision for educational reasons to extend our periods. So we'd have one hour periods and 70 minute periods. And that was probably four or five years ago. And my first thought was fantastic. We can actually use a board game because you can get games in there where they can play them in an hour, at, right? And 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 be uh, and and have a meaningful play experience. So um, that's part of it. I'm looking for a game that I can play that the kids can play in 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, if they can play it in one setting, that's that's going to be better than two settings. Um, there's all sorts of ways you can try and save game stage. Uh, you can take pictures. Uh, I once created, I once put a digital picture of a Catan map up on screen, and we just used digital pen to mark where people put stuff um, when they played it on their boards so that they could have this kind of uh, uh, record. Difficulty-wise, um, I mean, quite honestly, I've got a figure in mind. You're looking about somewhere between like a 2.1 and a 2.2 or 3 on Board Game Geek. Uh, any more complicated than that, and it's probably going to be too much to do for a let's learn this, let's play this. So um, games I've used this year or this past year when I was teaching ancient world history, I'm shifting courses, so I've got to find new board games. Uh, Roll Through the Ages, the Bronze Age, love it. Um, fantastic, right? Yahtzee dice rolling, but you're, and you, it's a roll and write. So you get to keep track of the things that you've built and the food that your cities are consuming and stuff like that. I can teach kids to play that in 15 minutes and have them have a meaningful first playthrough in 40 minutes. So that's, that's a perfect game. Uh, Seven Wonders Architects. That's one of the various Seven Wonders spinoffs. Um, this one is just based on you're trying to build your wonder of the world and you're trading in resources and things like that. Um, that's another one. I can teach people how to play it in about 10 or 15 minutes and they can have a meaningful game um, in, well, 30. That's the thing. If you are teaching ancient world history and want to use board games, Seven Wonders are architects. Once you've got kids trained to play it, they can play it in 25 to 30 minutes, which is amazing. Uh, uh, to be able to do something that fast. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for things that are not too complicated on the, on the, on the rules or the playthrough turn. Um, I've used Catan. I'll probably use Catan again this year with my class that's on imperialism in games. Um, I've tended not to use Catan as much just because it's so abstract and I want something that's a little more closely tied to things. But that works as well as far as a learn and play. Yeah. Yeah, this actually... Brings up another question. So um, <laughs> I'm full of them. Uh, no, no so, worries. It's fun to talk. Yeah. So you talked about, you know, a lot of commercial games that fit your classroom. So when you're looking for something commercial, it's not just about weight, right? I guess it has to be about what the game can teach. Um, yeah. It sounds like you also design a lot of games yourself for your classroom. So yeah, I mean, I, w I wish it were more, but I'm a perfectionist. But I have two right now that I'm running uh, in in a couple of classes that I really really like um, that I'm still continuing to develop. And then I've got a third one that I've got to kind of put on the shelf for a bit. But yeah, I've been designing for I think the first physical game I designed for students was in 2000 and 
won. So yeah, I guess I have been designing for a while. As you know, I, I've, I, I've been laughing with you about, you know, some people are gatekeeping and say that I'm not a game designer, but I've, I've certainly been designing games for 20 years. So you can make of that what you want. I mean, if you design games, I don't know what else you'd be. So. <laughs> right. A house plant. No, probably a game designer. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so I guess where I was going with that, though, is it so it sounds to me like you will take a game like Catan, even though it doesn't necessarily fully fit your purposes in the classroom because it's close enough that you can use it to make the point you need to make. I assume yeah, a lot of your designs kind of arise from your desire to communicate something that doesn't exist in a readily teachable commercial game. So what yeah. kinds of things prompt that from you and what kinds of mechanisms like I want to hear about some of the stuff you're bringing in your classroom to try to teach kids the things that you really want to say to them through a game. Yeah. So so the games that um, the game that I've been designing the longest and came up with a breakthrough in design this year that I think is really going to move it forward, um, maybe get it into a state where I can give it to people who aren't in classrooms, is on the fall of the Roman Republic. And I had, well, so I had this game um, in mind that I started designing. I, I had a version of it 20 years ago, and it was on Roman aristocrats competing for offices and how that led to uh, empire and conquest and things like that, and how there's this intense competition between these aristocrats for power and office and things like that, because that's kind of like my dissertation geek stuff that I like. Um, and um, at some point in there, I was, I, did I even get to play it? I don't, you know, I honestly don't even know if I got to play Republic of Rome. The, I'm sure I haven't played the original Avalon Hill version. I don't know that I ever got to play the, is it GMT? I can't remember who remade uh, it. Valley Let's Games. Play. Yeah, oh, Valley Games. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they had this fantastic part in it. Most of it, it was like, yeah, that's fine. It's okay. But the part that I thought was fantastic was if you don't band together collectively to defeat the wars of the Republic as they grow up, then everybody loses. But if you do band together and defeat the threats to the Republic, then only the person who gets the most dis uh, dignity um, during all of that wins. And I thought that was perfect because capturing that idea of aristocrats competing, <clears throat> excuse me, intensely, um, but um, not wanting to go too far or the state wouldn't function anymore, I thought was great. And Republic of Rome is too complicated for, for high school kids to play in class. I used a modified version once. I basically took the games and wrote a set of rules that was a simplified version where we cut out all this stuff. And I had the kids... I, I got a field trip cleared again. Love my school. I got a field trip cleared where we spent six hours in, 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 a, in a room with like pizza delivery uh, playing this game. And that's as close as I got, <clears throat> but it was still too complicated. So what I've been working on is a Roman Republic competition collapse game that's um, easier. That's, that's more playable. And I'm going to test out the new version in the spring when my Roman Republic course comes along. But there, I really wanted to teach a dynamic. I wanted to teach this idea of aristocrats are trying to block each other from getting meaningful legislation and reforms and things done, which you know, it's a point of view, uh, um, but I think it has some merit. And in their blocking of those things, they developed rivalries and got to the point where nothing was really being done for the rest of the the rest of the world that the republic was ruling. It was just these aristocrats kind of bashing at each other for honors and things like that. And so it became really easy once one became powerful enough to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take over and nobody out there in the Mediterranean is going to care because we all just look like a bunch of rich uh, aristocrats fighting with each other for our own privileges and stuff like that. So that kind of dynamic is something I wanted to get. Um, the other one I've designed recently that I've been liking and I'm putting more work into uh, this year, too, is called De Agricultura, right? The Cato reference. Um, and it is the, what did I call it? I wanted to make sure I, that my tongue was enough in cheek. It was the universal, excessively abstract uh, mo uh, peasant agriculture uh, simulator. Um, <laughs> and I wanted something 
that takes you out of great person history, right? Because so many of these board games and video games put you in the position of the great person, right? Making the decisions, the politician, the, the, the monarch, the things like that. And so I wanted something that really got into um, what it's like to be a peasant farming. Um, and so that one, I did a lot, of, I did some research and there's an awesome blog out there by a historian named Brett Devereaux, who does this series on bread and farming and subsistence. And it was perfect. And, and, and what he, what he helped me to see, cause I'd known some of those pieces, but I'm not an agricultural historian. He helped me see that risk management was the core kind of decision that peasants had to make, you know, am I going to plant this crop or this crop? Am I going to have backups? How much am I going to have in backups? How much seed am I going to preserve? And, and that, that becomes the central thing. And so I think sort of to wrap it around to your question, sort of big thing, what am I trying to teach? I'm trying to teach something about agency in systems because that's what games do the best, right? Is teach you about individual agency or, or state agency or whatever you're playing as, right? And systems that help or hinder it. I, I call that a historical problem space. Um, and, and games are really good at that. So that's what I'm trying to do there. The one that I have not tried out yet, other than like really light playtesting, was I wanted to do a game on missionary religion spreading um, because I thought it would be really cool to have a game about early Christianity spreading, but you have to take out all the actual content so that people don't get offended that you're talking about these things and instead talk abstractly about, about uh, spreading religion. So I kind of had this game of missionary expansion that's pretty cool but i haven't done anything more with that yet oh that does sound interesting sounds up my alley um so uh, oh yeah i guess it would be with your with your field yeah yeah so first fun fact uh brett has actually been a guest on this podcast so oh, I, will put, I will put a link to brett devereaux's episode in the show notes for everyone because this uh historical game circle just gets better i like it <laughs> yeah, he, his stuff is great it's so and and he writes in ways that and just yeah as as a pitch for his stuff if you're doing historical game design about anything he's talking about read about read his blog because chances are good that he's looked at it in a systemic way that's going to make it lend itself very well to games indeed and also you walked right into my trap no i'm kidding i wanted to ask you about historical problem spaces so this is the perfect moment uh so a lot of your scholarship centers on what you refer to as historical problem spaces so for people who are kind of on ramping into your work what is a historical problem space and what makes gaming a unique access point for one so a historical problem space is is um bottom line games about hit about uh, the past games about history present their history as if it were a historical problem space so that's that's kind of the the baseline statement if it's a game about history it's presenting its history as a historical problem space well, what does that mean okay it's not it doesn't mean anything fancy though there are interesting ramifications for teaching and design it means that games about history present the world in terms of a player agent um, which could be a person, could be fictional, could be historical, could be the state, right? You're, we're playing Europa Universalis, you're the state. Whereas if you're playing Assassin's Creed, right, you're an individual. So you got a player agent, they're in a world, some kind of realized, partially realized or wholly realized or whatever world. And that could be three-dimensional and it could be described in text, but there is some game world that they're in. In that game world, they have goals that the designers have set out for them. And the problem that the player agents have that make it historical problem space then is to solve the problems that are set by the goals. Now, you don't have to, right? You can play games for whatever reason you want and you can reject all the goals that the designers have for them. But historical games, I haven't seen a historical game yet. Um, somebody's gonna go design one now that, that proves me wrong on this and that's fine. I haven't seen a game yet that didn't have goals that the designer set for you on some level, whether you chose to follow him or not. So player agent with goals in a world and that world contains stuff. I call them elements. And the stuff is stuff that either helps you or constrains you. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm certainly inspired by affordance thinking, but it's not quite the same as affordances because I, I would suggest that as game designers, myself included, um, and just re, you know, as game players, Definitely in video games, 
a lot of the time in board games, there is nothing in that game that doesn't boil down to, is this going to help me get my goals or is this going to hinder me from getting my goals? Um, and that's actually a bit of a problem <laughs> as far as like how it's presenting the world, as far as like, you're, you know, you're either for me or against me. Um, so about uh, a decade ago, um, I started talking about games as historical problem spaces, and I've come up with some different passes, and I've talked about it in articles and in Gaming the Past. Um, what it all means is, A, be aware when you're teaching historical games in the classroom, when you're playing historical games as a player who's interested in the history, if you're doing historical game studies, be aware that it's not a text narrative. Be aware that it's not a video. Be aware that it's not these other things. It's a game, so there's going to be some kind of player agent. They're going to have some kind of goals, and they're going to be trying to seek those goals. Um, and that's and that's going to be looking at history a particular way. Um, with with the peasants, right? You could have a, you could have a video about peasants that focuses on the emotional struggles of being a farmer in in bad weather. But if a game does it as a history, it's going to have some kind of person who's a player agent. They're going to have some kind of goals, and they're trying to do it within a world. So that's all I really mean with historical problem space. Um, I developed it to understand the medium more, but then also understand another part. And this is an interesting difference between board games and video games. It's, it's the only one I've found for historical problem spaces. Um, all the parts of the game fit together. And so if you're going to critique a game, whether you're a scholar doing it or a teacher doing that with students, don't critique how the player agent is represented in the game without thinking about the rest of the game and the genre and what it is, right? So don't critique the Assassin's Creed uh, 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 protagonist of the day uh, for being able to jump around and do athletically amazing things without remembering that it's the third person game. Um, and third person games are usually based on these over the shoulder views of figures that, that um, uh, kind of kind of climb and fight and all these things. If you're going to play a game about uh, trade and your goal is to make the most money possible, well, how does that fit in? Well, it's a game, so it's going to have goals and they're going to design things around it. Why is this group, uh, and this is, this is an important one, why is this marginalized group not necessarily represented? Well, probably they should have been, but the designers were probably thinking about a problem space that maybe wasn't being broad enough, maybe wasn't understanding other people's roles. Um, board games are exactly the same. The, the only difference between board games and computer games on historical problem spaces is that board games don't have code. And so there is a negotiation of rules and the ability to interpret and stuff in board games that you don't have in computer games. But player agent, world, goals, elements, Board games do the same thing when they're presenting history. You also have a deep interest in, I think, distinguishing the way that we treat board games as a historical representation from the way that we treat text. I mean, as you know, within academia, right, the idea of the textbook, the monograph, the article, like that is the standard way of communicating mm -hmm. our ideas and opinions and evidence about history, how it works, what really happened. So how do we... I guess, show the proper respect for games, because I feel like that's something that is an interest of yours. Yeah, well, it's, it's yeah, it's a great question. There's a lot of, uh, there, there's been a lot of writing, over, not a lot, but in, <laughs> relative on these subjects, um, on what do you do with historical games? Because a number of people have realized that, I mean, it's, it's not really an argument to be had whether they're history. Um, the only argument for game, historical games not being history is, is an argument that privileges text. And there, there are no kind of reasonable grounds for why text has to be privileged. It just happens to be a medium that we've been using longer than, than many other mediums in our, or many other media in, in our society. So um, what do you do with that power of historical games to represent? And there certainly have been claims that suggest that you need more historians designing them. What you really need are historians designing the games, and then you'll have historical games that provide proper history. And that's, that's I mean, that's colonizing, right? That's the historians colonizing games and saying you got to do it in, an, in a historian way. So I don't think that's probably the best approach to it. 
I think that I think that the thing maybe to think about is like, kind of like your question asks, what are the strengths? What is it that these these systems bring? Um, and here, we, right, we get into conversations about what is a game and what's agency. I was reading something yesterday, a fascinating book. Um, oh, on Game Studies, Study Buddies. I, they, they're they awesome, too. And uh, and so I was reading the, the latest book they were, they were commenting on. Um, understanding that world out there, I understand there's a whole bunch of scholarship talking about whether this is what makes a game a game versus a text or other things like that. And I'm not trying to trample on anybody's theses. For me, the ability to make choices as a player that affect the overall outcome of the game. And you can call that the outcome of the game narrative. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, I would want narrative to include everything the player was doing as, as the a player agent in the game and the ability to make choices that influence the overall outcome of that narrative. I would say that's the thing that games do that texts usually don't unless they're modified into a form of game. That's the sort of thing that games do that videos don't do unless they're modified. What was that one? Was it Bandersnatch or something like that? I never saw it, but there was... Do you remember that? There was like yeah. a game video on Netflix or something like that? Yeah, I remember that. I didn't play it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I didn't yeah. either. Um, so... so if they don't, uh, without modifications, game, uh, texts and film and other things aren't going to do that. So with a game, I think what you do is you start to think about, I want to look at a certain, at, at the agency of a certain person or people. I want to look at how that person or people's agency is curtailed by the world that they're in, whatever factors I define, they can be intellectual limits they can be physical limits like food and geography and stuff like that i want to know i want to know what you know can kind of constrain them um and i want to know what kind of decisions they can make and what kind of outcomes they can have through their agency in these systems that's what games do really well and um the powers there like um you know, Oregon Trail, right? They did a new version of it. Um, sorry, I keep using video game examples. Those are the ones I'm usually thinking about for uh, um, this. But like Oregon Trail uh, came out with a new version. But before it came out with a new version, there was When Rivers Were Trails, which was the awesome uh, indigenous produced uh, uh, game that was sort of speaking to uh, uh, Oregon Trail, but talking about being... Um, a Native American in Minnesota, um, and, and I'm not going to do a disservice by mispronouncing the name of, of, of the people of the nation, um, but you are in Minnesota in the early 1900s and, and um, forced from your home by U.S. land policies and needing to journey along and find a new place. And what they've done there is so fantastic because what they've done is it's still a historical problem space but it's a historical problem space focused on an agent that's marginalized. And so games can do that too. Like, like I hope my little peasant agriculture game will do at some point. So that's what I would say. Using, being, be aware of them, whether you're critiquing them for history or trying to use them present history for what they're really good about. They're really good about putting you in systems as an agent and making you see how those interactions work. Um, board games are extra good because you can get multiple perspectives in a way that you can't with computer games. So you can have different agents with different points of view uh, interacting with each other. Um, but at the end, that's agents and systems. That's what games do. That's great. Do you find that by giving your students agency in that historical problem space, that they identify more closely or feel more ownership of historical topics? Because in a way, they've been involved and if so, um, did the type of agency they got to exercise seem to affect who they sympathized with or like what they valued most from what they'd been taught? Yeah, those are great questions. So, you know, my my anecdotal evidence from little surveys and stuff that I do is that agency becomes really powerful for them as a concept. Um, and honestly, teaching with games has changed my teaching as a world history teacher over the years. I didn't teach about agency um, when I first started teaching 20 years ago, 
I don't know if you had this experience, Liz, but I wouldn't be surprised since you came from an ancient program, right? My, my experience was, here's the ancient texts. Our job is to understand these texts, and under, right? And yeah, were there human beings involved? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but let's look at them through their texts. Um, and so games got me to think more about agency, got me to think more about equity and diversity, got me to think more about, about world systems, got me to think about all these kind of things that you can sometimes lose if you're just focusing on looking at, at, at a text and illuminating it. So I definitely think I'm getting, uh, making progress with that, with agency. I'm learning as I go. I mean, I, I'm constantly trying to sort of revise what I do. I do think there's a danger. I think maybe you were alluding to that, right? Since so many of our games at the moment are based on the powerful and the hegemonic, um, what are you doing, right? If you're having your kids basically identify with the powerful all the time. Um, what I try to do there um, is two things. One, that's why I tried to design this peasant agriculture game a couple of years ago, because I can use it as a start and say, remember, there are these systems of exploitation going on um, for 90% of the population that we're not looking at most of the time. Um, but the other thing is I get them to pick on it. I, I've, I've often thought, and I think it does hold true, getting students to criticize a board game or a video game and its point of view is a great way to empower them to critique. Um, when you play Seven Wonders Architects, uh, I had them write a little essay. Was it great person history or was it masses history? And some of the kids were really clever and were like, well, actually, it does do some masses history because as you, there's like seven layers to your uh, wonder that you can build. And there's little people on the scaffolding that you can see and stuff like that. And, and, <laughs> and, and I'm like, OK, 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 that's fair. Right. But at the end of the day, who are you really? Right. You're the person who's deciding all trade, all construction, all everything. You're the great person. And so trying to get them uh, to think about that. Uh, I was using a city builder maybe last year, and some kids did a really nice job looking at social hierarchy and show, and, and uh, taking the game to task that it, in, enslavement wasn't represented, even though in ancient Mesopotamia there was enslavement. Um, so so I, I, I'm, I think you do actually, you do absolutely have to be careful about agency and what you're saying about it and whose agency you're representing. For me, that's that analysis part that you shouldn't do the game without. I, I would the uh, I, I wrote a, a blog essay. Uh, um, the unexamined game is not worth playing, riffing off Socrates like 13 years ago. And of course, absolutely, go play games and don't critique them all you want in your personal life. But in it, but but in a history uh, education setting, you got to critique them. Um, and that's the part that kind of gets us into our responsibilities as scholars and human beings and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So interestingly, though, right, we will find we are finding more diversity among board game de designers, more diversity in board game topics. Um, so this is going to get better and better. There's going to be more options for playing as the marginalized people um, as, as more people design games like like your like your Night Witches game. I mean, I guess they're not marginalized to some extent because they're like, you know, kick butt like airplane uh, like fighter pilots and bombers and stuff like that but women in in combat are certainly an undertreated subject uh, so yeah and i won't but i could talk a lot about a lot of the decisions that david and i have made in terms of how we're choosing to present them and which elements of their mm -hmm. identities are represented in what ways um because those are all you know really key choices i think when you're designing a game but actually, you know, what you said about Texas just had me sitting here thinking for a bit, because I think, especially because I came from a religious studies program, right? Like where we did ancient Christianity and, you know, there's like a mix of people with different religious backgrounds, but it was certainly considered a little bit distasteful to be doing the research purely from your own perspective or to prove your own point, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Like it was, mm -hmm. you know, we were all looking for some sort of common language. I think it was... I think the focus on text I th comes from this desire to feel like you've depersonalized a lot of the work and therefore made it more intellectual because it is more objective. And I think yeah. that in a way, 
you know, games can trivialize things, but I also think that games personalize things and mm -hmm. make you feel about a subject differently from the way that studying a text might do. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's that I, I keep I I, I I try and figure out my words. I um, think of that as the agency issue again, right? That they're yeah. putting you in a, in a particular um, space. Um, games are really good at strategical and tactical thinking, uh, too, because that's a place where we commonly have that sort of agency. Um, I do a class with seniors where we look at games of imperialism. And one of the really scary things about uh, 1990s pro-imperial project, pro-colonization project games like Sid Meier's Colonization and and uh, lots of other games that came out, they're really good at putting you in the mind of a conqueror who is not much interested in the individuality and personality of the people they're conquering because it problematizes it. Right? I mean, it basically turns into your problem is how to expand, how to grow. Um, so, yeah, so, so that's a, that's a, that's a danger, but also a reward, right? That same putting you in those, in, in those uh, uh, shoes of the conqueror can put you in the shoes of uh, a person displaced from their home, can put you in the, per in the shoes of, of, of any number of, of peoples. But yeah, I think you're right. I think the text thing is to depersonalize. I think also, I mean, it's part, that's part of our tradition, right? That's the ancient history tradition too, right? Is that, is that pointing to the text since we only have three of them, you know, you better, you better point it. No, no, there's four now, but yeah. Um, so you just kind of go that way. But I think you're right. I think there is a depersonalizing that goes with that. So if you are a new teacher who's thinking about introducing more gaming to the classroom, what would you recommend to uh, that person? How would, how would you get started? Uh, how would you start introducing these things into your class without making yourself feel overwhelmed? So I think um, if I were a teacher, let's just sort of say general world history. Um, if I were a teacher doing general world history and I'd started, um, I'd look at Roll Through the Ages of the Bronze Age. Uh, it's it, it's a nice game if you're doing want to do board games for getting people into it. Uh, I'd look at um, um, Seven Wonders Architects. It's a good game to work with. Um, video games, if you're doing U.S. history, I'd probably start with the Mission U.S. series. Um, there's a whole series of middle school uh, uh, audience designed um uh, games on U.S. history that are sort of point-and-click adventures. They run on most machines. They are free. They come with teacher support. Um, so I'd look at that. I might I might try Bicarbonize because it could run on every kid's phone, basically. Um, I would I would basically try and find a game like that where it's not going to take me too long to do it and have it be an experiment and see what we get out of it. I wouldn't commit to something huge. I think it's a very, I think it's a very scary idea to use a grand strategy game as your first game um, that that you're using in the classroom. Uh, also, very scary to use Republic of Rome in you know <laughs> in, in in your classroom. So I would start with that. I would I would look for a game. Oh, the, you know what? There's a game too. Uh, shoot, what's the name? I'm going to use this next year. I haven't played it yet. Um, I forget. There are these two games on resistance and protest, and one's called Block by Block, and the other is called something that I can't remember. And one of them is coming out in like a fourth edition Kickstarter, but they have a third edition that's print and play that they've made available. Um, look for things like that. Look for things that are freely available. Uh, I guess the other thing I'd do is probably write me an email and say, hey, can you help me kind of think about any games that I might look at? And I'd be happy to do that. I love doing that. Um, but start simple. Start simple, start with an experiment, and most of all, make sure the kids do a debriefing analysis. If they don't reflect on it in writing or reflect on it in conversation or reflect on it in a recorded chat, whatever, but they got to reflect on it. Otherwise, the learning really doesn't happen, or rather, learning happens, but it's not necessarily any of the learning that we're trying to target. And formal education, right, is trying to actually predict learning outcomes and trying to design towards them. Well, that's why you have to debrief in games. So keep it simple, uh, keep it short. Katam would be a good one too. Um, 
Uh, I have a colleague here who uses Katam with sixth graders to teach about world geography, and it's fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, like terrain and things like that. Um, keep it simple. Keep it cheap. Make sure that they reflect. Interesting. Yeah, I like it. I think that's a good a good starting place, and also kind of a good stopping place because we're moving to the the softy questions now. Uh, so the first one I'll ask is just, um, what have you been playing recently that you've been enjoying? So recently, um, so uh, on computer, I've been playing Fallout Four because I never play a game when it's new, uh, because I'm what's my dad like to call it frugal. Yeah, I'm frugal. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, so I, I got I got Fallout 4 on sale and bounced hard off it um, when it turned out there was crafting and then came to a spot in my life where I was like, I'm ready for this now. So I put 30 or 40 hours into that. Um, I've been loving playing Seven Wonders Architects with my parents because I like the fact that it's got theme, but it's not too difficult. Um, so as a board game, I've been enjoying that. Um, I guess it's the Seven Wonders podcast. I have a, I have a buddy here who's a math teacher, a new friend. Um, who taught me Seven Wonders Duel. And it's perfect for two teachers that have like 35 minutes once in a while where they're both free, where they can, where they can play a two-person game. I've been, loving, um, I've been loving Seven Wonders Duel. Um, I think those are the big ones I've been playing right now. Um, oh, and I, just, and I just picked up War Tales, uh, which is a, vi a video game again, which is a... Uh, Everything gets called like an XCOM clone. It's not really an XCOM clone, but it's basically like a tactical role-playing game where you have a little battle map with your with your figures and you can move them around and do this in turns and stuff like that. So those are kind of the new ones I'm working on now. And then probably all game playing will stop soon because what I really have to do is get that agriculture game <laughs> together in a better version. I had, oh my God, this game pushes so many cubes because I really wanted them to get the sense of planting and hunger and stuff like that. But like the original way it's designed, if you have a class of like 16 kids, there's hundreds of cubes being pushed around. And that just, it's just not any good. <laughs> I've got to simplify it and get it down uh, and stuff like that. But that's the stuff I've been playing around with with games recently. Uh, and if people want to find you and talk to you some more about all of this, I know you've mentioned your contact information throughout, but let's put it in one place. Where can you be found online? Sure. So gamingthepast.net is always a good way to find me. Um, that's my website for 13, 14 years. Uh, it's collected basically all of my thinking. Uh, it has bibliography for people who want to read those things. It has um, a lot of recs to computer games, but I've got to fix those because a lot of them are in the pre-flash days. It is underdeveloped on board games as far as recommendations for them and that's an area that i want to spread into at some point but gaming the past dot, dot net uh on twitter i'm gaming the past uh, all one word on mastodon i'm gaming the past at historians.social uh i'm not afraid for you to have my email it's jmc.hst at gmail.com i love cold emails where somebody wants to talk shop about these things so feel free to just introduce yourself and and ask me a question and i'll be happy to talk with you Fantastic. And I, of course, can be found anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to either of us, those of you who are out there listening. Uh, Jeremiah, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a lovely conversation, and it's given me a lot to think about as a teacher and as somebody who is interested in, you know, taking games and history and gaming history seriously. Well, thanks so much, Liz. I really appreciate getting a chance to talk about all this stuff. Uh, I, I appreciate your time and your and your interest. So thank you so much. We will definitely have to meet again about this work in the future. Uh, but yeah. for now, uh, thank you so much. Uh, everybody who's out there, please like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming.